Welcome to the webinar, Conversation with President McKinney's International Students' Questions and Answers. Hi, my name is Dr. Jun Liu. I'm Vice President and Vice Provost for Global Affairs at Stony Brook University. Stony Brook University prides itself on being a global campus. and It is home to more than 6,000 international students from 80 countries. Our international students are exceptional, active in local community and taking on leadership on campus organizations and clubs. So I'm particularly delighted to have President McKinney take time to speak with our international students today to learn about the issues we are concerned about. So first of all, let me introduce President McKinney. President Maury McKinney joined Stony Brook University recently on July the 1st as our sixth president. Having served as executive vice president and a provost at the University of Texas, Austin, and prior to her position as a provost, uh, as a social vice provost for academic affairs at the University of Virginia, she brings with her a wealth of experience as a leader in higher education. She is deeply committed to our international students and their success. As you read in her email to the campus community on July the 13th, Dr. McKinnis has been actively engaged in the current challenges facing our international students related to student and exchange visitor program policy. She will be advocating on your behalf as circumstances continue to evolve and until the situation has been resolved. So we are truly very fortunate to have such a caring and committed leader. And it is my distinct pleasure to an honor to present President McKinney's to you all. So Dr. McKinney's uh, would like to give you some opening remarks, please. Well, good morning to you all. Um, I'm really glad to have an opportunity to speak with you, um, to uh, answer questions, to hear from you, to understand, um, you know, maybe what attracted you to Stony Brook and um, what we can continue to do to support you to make sure that you have the, the best experience here um, and that we're doing what we can to help you prepare for the next stage in your life and career. Um, I, I know, Dr. Liu, you gave me some questions. I don't know whether you want me to talk through some of those or um, what, how you would, would like to get our conversation going this morning. Thank you so much, Dr. McKinney. Uh, what I'd like to do as a moderator is to first invite our panelists to briefly introduce themselves so you know who they are, but okay. also we have many uh, international students online. So we are going to give the floor to the panelists after their introduction to ask some questions. And then we are going to open the floor for others to join us. Is that okay. all right? Yep, all right. Fine. I mean, let, yep. me, let me just say then a, a couple other things. I want you all to know how deeply committed I am to our international students and more broadly to globalizing the university community. It was one of my top priorities at Provost at my previous institution and, and I myself as a faculty member at the University of Virginia. Um, in fact, uh, one summer got the opportunity to lead a global uh, comparative study abroad program. It is, um, and I work to create a new global studies major. And um, you know, these are priorities that have really sort of threaded through uh, my academic life as an art historian uh, you know what did what did I do and study in both my undergraduate and graduate career you know I studied world cultures um, world histories and world cultures this is academically what I care enormously about um, and I know the great value that each and every one of you bring to our campus community and I want to make sure that we at Stony Brook um, are also bringing great value to you in your experiences here. 
Um, so I look forward to being able to learn a little bit more about each of you who are serving as panelists and then to be able to answer questions that you might have. Thank you so much. So let's get started. Uh, Nicholas, you, you will introduce yourself first. Hi, good morning to all. Uh, I'm Nicolas, a PhD student from Argentina in the program of Anthropological Sciences. I study the evolution of the brain to understand why and how humans are so unique and special. Very good. Uh, Xiao Qin, Nicole. Hi, uh, Dr. McKinney, um, Dr. Liu and everyone. Um, so my name is Qin. I am a PhD in Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. I also serve as the president for the Graduate Student Organization. Um, and I'm from China. Yes. Thank you so much, Nicole. It's good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, good to see you. <laughs> You met uh, Dr. McInnes uh, way, way, way earlier. How about the Malesh? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Malesh. I am from, I'm a PhD student in computer science department. Um, uh, I, uh, currently, I am serving as a vice president of graduate student organization. Um, yeah, um, nice to meet you all. Thank you, thank you. Sarah? Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah. Um, I'm an MBA in marketing student, and I'm also from Brazil. And I was a student at the Intensive English Center last semester. Thank you so much, Sarah. Subami. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bisola Ala Shubomi Babali. I go by Shubomi. I'm a senior. I'm a double major in geology and psychology, and I'm minoring in China studies. I'm from Nigeria. Nice to meet you all. Great to meet thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, so we have a Ming Ming, please. Hi everyone, my name is Ming Ming. Uh, I'm from China. I'm a sophomore in the next fall. Uh, I'm also a student assistant in China Center. It's all about me, thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, last but not least, Fanny. Hi, uh, my name is Fanny. I'm a senior and I'm majoring in business management and sociology. Uh, I'm from Sweden and I'm also part of the women's soccer team at Stony Brook. Very good. So Dr. McKinney, this is uh, just seven uh, people from, as you know, different countries, different majors, graduate, undergraduate, mixed. So they have prepared a, a number of questions for you. And I'd like to invite them to ask those questions and uh, get your uh, answers for them. So Sarah, we'd like to start with you. Um, great, so I'm going straight to my first question. Um, knowing that you have studied art history, in what ways do you think it prepare you to take on a position such as president of Stony Brook? Yeah, so um, let's be clear, none of you who are in graduate programs are taking any courses, I suspect, that are about like higher education administration, right? In fact, you're probably not taking even many courses on how do you be a great professor, right? We tend to, in our PhD programs, study very deeply and gain a knowledge base in our fields, learn how to do research, learn how to work with others on solving problems, but it doesn't prepare you to be a higher education administrator or a president, right? So that experience tends to come along the way. Um, what I think, you know, every, it doesn't matter what field you come from, you can be a great university president. I do think there's some value in my field, a humanistic field, where you learn how to analyze, you learn how to think critically, you learn how to communicate effectively, you learn how to um, go back and forth on ideas. Um, we all do that in all of our fields, but humanists probably focus a little more on the kind of communication side of things because um, we write books, right? And as have I, right? So I've written five books and a bunch of articles. Um, but being a higher ed administrator is an entirely different thing. So that experience starts to come as you take on academic leadership roles at your university, right? So typical sort of pathway, department chair, 
associate dean in a college of arts and sciences. This was my pathway. Um, working in the provost's office in academic affairs. I can tell you none of that was a plan. There was never a moment when I was sitting there as an undergraduate student or a PhD student thinking, I want to be an academic leader, right? I instead thought, I want to be a great art historian. I want to be a great teacher. I want to be a great researcher and scholar. And the other things were just experiences I got along the way. My interest in moving into administration was the really, so I'm very mission driven person. I believe in the importance of public higher education in giving a diverse group of students an amazing opportunity at a great education and our opportunity to prepare the world's next generation of leaders. And I can make a contribution to that as a faculty member, and I believe I did for the 20 years that you know I was primarily a faculty member. But I feel like my contribution to that mission has a greater impact when I'm helping the whole institution figure out how do we maximize the experience that every student has and the opportunity for every faculty member to make a difference as an educator and as a scholar and researcher. Um, so I'm, I found myself, you know, and as an anthropologist, I'm sure you've spent a lot of time thinking about systems and cultures and the interactions. You know, being a higher educational administrator is a fascinating look at how do we get cultures, and by here I'm not talking global cultures, I'm talking like departmental cultures. How do we get departmental cultures that are actually very different from one another, work together and come together to have an impact as a whole that's greater than the individual parts? And I've just found that a really rewarding thing to work on um, in academic leadership. It really is, um, you know, you can feel really great at the end of the day when you get an opportunity to see what a difference the research of our faculty makes and what a difference we have made in the lives of students. Thank you so much, Sarah. You asked a very good question, and uh, uh, you know, the, Dr. McKinney has uh, given us a full picture, a, a range of the issues. I'm very impressed. So, Sarah, I, I think you have another question. Do you? Okay. Yeah. So, um, as you mentioned, I saw that you wrote some books, um, and throughout your career, I saw that it's clear that you have dedicated a lot of time to studying Black history. Um, so has it always been an important topic for you or was it was there a specific event that made you gravitate towards it? I wouldn't say a significant event as in like a single marker, but I would say and some of this, you know, since since you all are all international students, I don't know how well versed you are in the history of the US. Um, so, you know, I grew up in the US South. Um, I did my grade school and high school in the state of Tennessee and started school in the 1970s, right? Which to you all is ancient history and to me was not that long ago. Um, and in the 1970s in the American South, it was not that long after the passage of the Civil Rights Act. And it was not that long after schools were integrated. Right, so had I gone to school in the 1950s in the US South, even in public education, there were schools for white students and schools for African American students. And so I'm growing up in a world that has recently integrated, but I can tell you that the history I was taught as a child was a history that was an entirely a white perspective. And then I went to college. And I began taking courses that challenged that white dominant narrative and that revealed to me a much fuller complexity 
of the real history of the United States of America. And as I uh, moved into my PhD studies, I felt that a history that had not yet been told was a history of the kind of lived experience of the US South, right? So my degrees are in art history, but I'm really a cultural historian, right? I don't write about imported artists. I don't write about aesthetic and stylistic movements. I write about how people lived and the physical worlds that they inhabited and how their histories and cultures shaped and changed those worlds. And so I believed that I had an opportunity as somebody who understood the built environment, as we often call it in my discipline, the lived experience, to be able to add something to the work that historians were also doing to talk about the history of slavery. And so let me give you an example about how this plays out um, and I'll talk about the last book that I worked on with a, a few other scholars. So I was a faculty member for most of my career at the University of Virginia. The University of Virginia was a university designed architecturally and as a physical space by Thomas Jefferson, who authored the U.S. Declaration of Independence and who declared that all men are created equal but who in his own life never fought for that principle. He never fought to end slavery. And in the university he built, he expected it to be built and run by enslaved individuals. And it was for the first 50 years. And for the students at the University of Virginia, they were very upset because UVA was silent about that history. Right, so as it owned its own history, it just sort of said, and the buildings are beautiful. I mean, he was a great architect, right? So it, they described the aesthetic beauty of the buildings and how genius they were. And then they kind of popped ahead to, and then there was an American Civil War. And then they popped ahead another hundred years and said, oh, and by the way, we now admit African-American students and women. So it was all male, all white until the late 1960s. And so that history of enslavement and then white segregation was something that the university hadn't been talking about. And so working with students, hundreds who have now worked on this project, we did research on the history of the institution to be able to recover the stories of enslaved people who worked there for decades and now the university is also moving into telling its history of segregation. This is an important piece of, of acknowledging a really difficult past and I think lays the groundwork for beginning to have conversations of what does an inclusive future look like. Um, so that is work that has been really important to me and the contribution as a historian that I can make is to help uncover and talk about histories that have often long been hidden away. It's a very long answer to your question, but there you go. That's all right, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I know we have other panelists. Now let's uh, move from Brazil to China. So what about Mimi? You have a question, right? Yeah, hi, Dr. Mechanics. Uh, my question for you is, uh, do you have experiences of studying or being a scholar abroad? If so, what was it like? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, uh, as a student myself, I did not study abroad as an undergraduate, uh, but I went to London to continue art historical studies um, at, in between my undergraduate and starting my PhD. Um, as a faculty member, I did a, a number of things. Um, I led a bunch of short-term visits abroad in many different places. The longest and most sustained thing I did, I kind of referenced earlier, um, and I'll, I'll try to explain this as briefly as I can. The University of Virginia used to be the academic program sponsor for this thing called Semester at Sea. And what Semester at Sea is, I see a few shaking heads. 
Um, but basically the concept behind it is you have a ship and you put five to 700 college students on it with about 30 to 40 faculty. And as you are sailing from port to port, you have class days. Okay. I was the academic dean for one of those voyages that, um, that traveled for 10 weeks with about 550 college students. Right now, we have some international students still outside the United States. And Fanny is one of them. She is currently residing in Sweden. So she has a, a couple of questions for you. Sure. Fanny? Hi. Uh, so my question is, what is something you have experienced or been part of at your past educational institutions that you would like to bring to Stony Brook as well, either as a student or as an employee? Yeah, so I don't know that I have a specific list because of course, I think it's enormously important to understand communities to figure out where they are and, and what their aspirations are for the future. Um, I can say that as sort of bedrock principles um, are ensuring that we give great educational opportunities to our students while they are here and supporting them in all of the ways we can to ensure their success both while they're here and preparing them for that next stage in life. Um, and the importance for a research university of promoting research, discovery, innovation, um, but nothing particularly specific while I'm still getting to know everybody. I mean, I'm in, I think, week three. Um, so mostly I'm, I'm still trying to get to know Stony Brook and all the great things that it is already doing and to hear from people what, what else they want us to be working on. So mental health issues among students are increasing and it is affecting both their personal life and education. So how do you stand towards this and what are you going to do to prioritize and support your students' well-being? Yeah, so mental health... Um, Challenges have been growing for adolescents and young adults um, for the last couple of decades. And for, as a research uh, sort of question, we don't fully know why that is, um, why the incidence of depression and anxiety, which are the two biggest um, sort of challenges that our young adults are facing. We don't fully know why it has grown so much, but it is a huge problem and something that uh, Stony Brook, I know, has been very focused on. I'll add to that, though, that however, um, however much of a challenge that was in March, that has exploded exponentially now, right? Everybody, no matter your current individual circumstances, everybody is facing enormous stress. Um, Many people have themselves been ill. They have family members who have been ill. Many of our students have family members who have passed away because of COVID. The disruption that COVID has caused has wreaked economic havoc on the lives of so many of our students and their families. And the stress of the uncertainty of your futures, of all of our futures, is difficult for all of us to know how best to process and deal with. We are all in such unknown times and we have nothing to lean on. We have nothing to say, oh, this was like this X number of years ago and, and we know how we're going to get through this because we don't. Um, and so we have to, and we are working as hard as we can to figure out how we both support our students, but also how we think as a community together. How do we design the kinds of support systems that enable us all to be there for each other? And that's going to be a really important thing for us to do. And, and there's a lot that we need to do to be kind to each other, to be patient and understanding with each other. Um, there's 
a lot that we're going to have to kind of figure out together. It needs everybody's good ideas. Um, and some of it is you all are going to have to help us figure out what kind of support you need. We honestly can't hire enough counselors to provide all the one-on-one -on -one counseling and therapy sessions that everybody wants because there aren't that many counselors. They're just like the demand worldwide is so great for this skill set that we're also gonna to need to think creatively together about what can we do with more group work together? And what are the biggest issues that everybody is facing and how can we support you through that? It's an enormously difficult and challenging time for everyone, especially for young adults who I know are worried about their futures, worried about the inter interruption to their academic lives, worried about things economically. Um, and I get that. And we want to be there to help support you. And y'all are going to have to help us figure out in some ways, what are the best ways we can do that? Um, and, and then I'll just add to that. And this is not a world, this Zoom, online sort of communication that feeds us in the way that we as humans want to be fed, right? Many of us suffer from not being able to interact with others on a daily basis. That kind of, that human connection that we get around our friends and our family and new people that we're meeting, that's a lot of what charges us on a day-to-day -day basis. That's a lot of what brings us joy on a day-to-day -day basis. And as a world, we've kind of lost that. Um, and we're gonna have to figure out how we all take care of ourselves in this world that has so many challenges facing us on a day-to-day -day basis. And some of that um, is work we're gonna have to figure out together because I don't have all the answers um, and I'm not sure anyone really does. Um, but I definitely, if you all have ideas, would love to know what they are and we'll continue to work on them together. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. McKinney. Actually, this is an issue, you know, we have uh, dealt with uh, for years because international students uh, not only leaving their own country to an unfamiliar territory, but also they have language issues, psychological issues and other issues. So yeah. at Stony Brook University, to echo what you said, uh, we try to rely on our peer mentoring and we, we really encourage our senior students to serve as mentors with incoming students or incoming international students. So over the last couple of years, we worked uh, very well by looking at the conversations, encounters they do or, and uh, the issues they, they do over online or in person. And I think, you know, with your coming, we try to really develop into that, uh, you know, uh, direction and try to encourage students to really find out some support, you know, from their peers, either in their own major or in other disciplines so they can expand their horizon to understand other you know, uh, students' uh, thinking and experience. So we, we certainly will continue, uh, Dr. McInnes, in this direction to help in our international students to succeed. Very good. So we are, uh, I'm, look, I'm moderator, I'm looking at the time. So far, so good. But still, we have other panelists who have are uh, eager to answer, uh, to ask questions. So Nicholas, you are the next. Uh, well, hi, Dr. McKinney, it's really nice to meet you, and it's a pleasure to exchange ideas with you, and welcome, of course, to Stony Brook. So, thinking about your academic expertise and educational background, I, I am wondering how our university can better and fully integrate social minorities as staff, faculty, and students. Yeah, this is really important work um, that I know Stony Brook has been working on for years, um, but obviously there is so much more work to be done. Um, our chief diversity officer, Judy Brown Clark, um, has, who joined us in February, like right before we had to move to remote instruction, um, has been meeting with and talking with um, so many communities 
to try to take what was an aspirational plan put together in 2016 and really figure out, well, how do we make that real actions? How do we work together as a community for meaningful change? Um, and I know that before the semester begins, we are gonna be communicating with the campus community about what some of those real actions are. I will say as a historian, I really do believe we are at a, a moment in US history that is different from where we've been in the past. There really is a, a significantly different conversation going on that gives me hope that we really are at a moment for not just talking, but really coming together for the kind of meaningful change that builds more inclusive communities and leads us, I hope, to the kinds of conversations about some of the systems and institutions in place in the US that have led to the decades of systemic racism that lead to the inequity that the US faces today. That is hard and difficult work and the change is not gonna come overnight. And so it is work that as a community, we are gonna have to attack in a sustained way and we can do so in multiple ways. We have researchers across the academic and medical fields who work on why we have the inequalities we have. And that's really important because it is that academic study that then gives us an understanding of the changes we need to make. So that's a piece of it. And then of course there's the lived daily experience that our students, faculty, and staff are experiencing. And that is part of what we've been trying to build a broader knowledge of understanding. How, what, what is it like to be part of this community? And once we understand where we still have challenges, we can put together a plan that moves us to a more equitable, and inclusive culture. Uh, there is much work to do. We need you all. Students are a huge piece of a movement towards equity and inclusion. Um, we need your voices. We're also gonna need your commitment to this work. Um, so thank you for that question. Really one of the most important questions of our time. Thank you so much. I know this is a huge uh, on your plate, and we, all international students communi uh, communities, you know, are already. And I think uh, we should encourage international students, as you said, to contribute to this, uh, you know, the very deep issue that we need to work on and uh, make everyone feel equally respected and working together. So, Nicholas, you have another question. Yes. Well, thank you so much for for your answer. My second question points to how our university can help the international student community to better prepare for a job market, both academic and, and extra academic, that is and will be impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for that question. I mean, that is an enormously important topic because really that is one of our roles as an educational institution is to make sure not only are we providing you with a great education, but are we also giving you the experiences, the skills, the opportunities to prepare you to make that next step in life, whatever you want it to be, right? For some of you, there may be additional graduate work you wish to pursue. And for others, you may be ready to move into a career that maybe is the career you're gonna be in the rest of your life or it may be a job and a career that may have either a shift later in your life or you might go back to graduate school later. And it, it's our role to make sure that we are getting you ready for that. Um, Stony Brook has a really great um, career center that I hope you all are leaning on and using. Um, they have been doing in the past, I know, a great job Boy, are we in a new world though, right? So 
we, we were doing a great job in a world where we under, we kind of understood how it worked and where the opportunities were. We don't know what the job market is going to look like. And for many careers, the skills people need are now changing. Many people are having to go into workplaces now that are entirely virtual. Um, and we need to make sure we're giving you the experiences to be ready for that. And we have to get really creative in thinking about and how are we going to connect you with internships and opportunities. Um, there's a separate piece of this for international students that I want to be very clear about. And that is, and we are going to continue to advocate loudly and strongly on issues like OTPS to make sure that our international students who wish to remain in the US and get a professional opportunity here, that that is gonna be available to you all. I am so worried about the many different changes that have been happening in visas and our approach to our international students. And this is another piece of it um, that is enormously important. And we work really hard to advocate on the federal level with our congressional delegation and others um, in DC and the federal government. Uh, to make sure that they understand how important that is. And that, of course, includes our ability to be able to attract great international students to come to America, to contribute to our educational environment, and to contribute to the strength and vitality of the U.S. as well. Thank you so much, Dr. McKinney. As you know, that life cycle of international students from admission to job placement, this is all they care about. And I'm glad that uh, you mentioned our Career Center and uh, we Office of Global Affairs is working with them to really look at international students job fair, a job market, maybe more online, virtually <laughs> in the future. But this is certainly something I think that uh, will also help our international students feel you know, once they're ready, they need to really, you know, go out to the market and, and, and present, prove themselves to be very useful to the society and also uh, satisfy their own, you know, uh, you know the, the ideal scenario. So anyway, uh, Xiao Qing, you are the next. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Um, so I'll just go straight to the questions. Um, many international students are self-conscious about their ability to communicate in English. As a result, they remain silent in classes and during activities. How would you ensure that their voices and concerns are heard and that they get the best out of studying at Stony Brook University through active participation? Yeah, thank, thank you. you for that question. And, and I should begin by saying to all of you, I so admire your ability to go abroad and do your education in a language that is not the one that you were raised speaking. Um, I have never gotten to that level of fluency in another language. I have studied many different romance languages because I needed them for my art historical research, right? So I got really comfortable reading. Uh, what all, Spanish, German, French, and Italian, but never fully got to exactly what you were talking about, that level of confidence that I could, any conversation, any setting, speak, right? And that is such an extraordinary accomplishment for all of you and something you should be really proud of yourselves um, for doing. Um, I also know it's exhausting. It's exhausting to have to communicate all day long in another language, um, and I get that. Um, so, you know, you all have that extra layer of effort that is required of you every day. Um, for students who don't yet have the, the level of self-confidence, I certainly hope they'll take advantage of all the opportunities that are provided at Stony Brook for you to gain in confidence and to gain in comfort doing so. Um, and I know that we provide a ton of support around that. I also hope that you will individually, like if you don't feel comfortable speaking in front of the whole class, 
still build a relationship with the faculty member. Talk to a fact. I was going to say go see a faculty member in office hours. We're probably not doing that. So talk to a faculty member during office hours. Uh, build that connection so that at least you're you begin to. If you feel more comfortable with your faculty member, you may eventually also feel more comfortable in the class. But at least also your faculty member knows you are fully engaged, you are participatory, and you can explain why you may not be as comfortable. Smaller group settings are often, I think, less intimidating than the really big ones. Um, and I totally get that. Um, and I know that there are lots of places inside global affairs and Dr. Liu's office. If you all have questions, issues, concerns, things you want us to know, please use those channels of communication. His office is a great advocate for issues that your community faces that we might not otherwise know about. So please be sure you're in good communication with them. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. McKinney. As you know, one of the panelists, Ming Ming, benefited from going to intensive English program. So as a conditional admitted students, I think that is a very good, uh, you know, uh, help for all international students incoming when they're in need. But also, uh, I, I realize, uh, you know, it is uh, not a one-time quick fix. You need to really encourage acculturate yourself. The language is one issue and acculturate yourself is another. So that is something that uh, we try to help internationals to be comfortable. Uh, just uh, on a side note, I myself uh, published a book on silence of international students in American uh, classroom. And I think we try to offer some workshops working with international students, really make them feel comfortable to leave out their uh, comfort zone and try to embrace themselves in the big community. I think that way we can really help uh, one another. So I'm uh, conscious about time, but we still have two panelists. So Bisola, would you please ask your question? Thank you. So onto my first question, what is your favorite thing about your career? Oh, favorite thing about my career. I think, I don't know that I can name a single thing. Um, I have always loved the uh, connection that I've had with my students over the years. So, you know, I still have many students that I taught long, long ago with whom I'm still in touch, right? And it's so rewarding to see how their lives and careers have progressed. And it's not like we're in frequent and regular contact, but, you know, every so often out of the blue, they'll write me a note. and. I think what everybody who is a faculty member, um, and so this is a good thing for you all to remember, years go by, and for many of you, we have no idea what happens, and we love hearing about you. So reach out and say hello to faculty members from the past. Um, but what I really um, value uh, about my work in higher ed and academic leadership is being able to feel good and to know that the institutions I've been involved with have been able to make such a difference in the world. If you think about the tens of thousands of students who are educated and set up for great lives and careers, and if you think about the impact of the research and scholarship and, and creative arts that our faculty are involved with, those things make a difference in the world. And public higher education is just this amazing place where people come together from all over the world. We learn from one another. We all uh, expand in our worldviews and in our knowledge. And in so doing, we then all go out and make a big difference in the world. Um, and that's a really great thing to be a part of. Very good. You. Uh, Isola, you have another question? Yes. Um, so how do you and the rest of the university plan to work out this academic year in a way that both health concerns and academic concerns are balanced and in such that students are able to make the most out of the upcoming semester? Yeah, thank you for that question. And that is really what our, virtually our every waking minute has been focused on 
um, really since the middle of March now. So I've only joined more recently, but the team at Stony Brook has been so focused on how do we balance the global epidemic and its very local manifestations here with the needs of our community. And so that has been both the healthcare needs of our community and the needs of our students. And as we plan for the fall, we've done so much listening to all of our community, our faculty and our students. And we understand what worked well last spring and what didn't work so well. And, and there is no doubt that immediate shift to remote instruction, that was not a planful shift, right? And there are really good ways to do online education. And there are ways that are not as effective. And when you have to switch immediately, you don't have time to build in all the more effective ways. So as we've been working on planning for the small fall semester, keeping health is really priority one. So we've spent so much time talking to infectious disease experts and public health officials, and we are constantly looking at the data, right? Every day we are looking at the infection rates of our local community. And as we bring students back to campus, we're also gonna be paying attention to where students are coming from. And we're gonna do everything we can to ensure that we hopefully don't have any cases as our community comes back together. So then how do we stay healthy together? And it is on all of us. If we want a semester where we have an opportunity to do some education together in, per in person and do some other gatherings together in person, it is incumbent upon all of us to follow the public health guidelines. Wear your mask, the single most important thing that we need to do. Wearing your mask social distancing and that's such a weird thing it is so weird when we are so used to being together right that's what human beings crave and yet now that's not a safe thing to do washing our hands frequently those are the three most important of those guidelines and we all need to do it together and it really is gonna take all of us actually holding our peers accountable for that as well. Because if we don't have everybody doing it, then we could find ourselves in a tough place. So we looked at our curriculum and pedagogically the courses that are just really hard to replicate online are ones and that, and that we thought we could do safely in a socially distant manner with groups that are not too large, or some of the courses that are going to be in person. We have some other courses where you can either be in person or you can be remote based on your circumstances. So we tried to give maximum flexibility to our students so that depending on your own individual circumstances, you can make this work to continue moving forward with your your academic path. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we uh, have one more panelist, and uh, Malesh will be the last to, to ask questions or questions. But uh, we also want to give the opportunity to uh, online listeners, and they might they have submit some question. So Malesh, can you uh, ask your question or combine them into one? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Liu and Dr. McInnes for giving me this opportunity to be here and ask questions. Um, so I, um, I had a couple of questions. Um, I think the first one is uh, related to uh, Sarah's. Uh, so you've been doing amazing research in your, pro in your past. Um, I just wanted to know at, po at what point did you decide or uh, how did you get interested in leadership over uh, your amazing research? Uh, so that is my first question. And the second question is, um, uh, so many international students recently uh, felt that uh, 
so the, the university was kind of slow and there was like insufficient reaction against recent ICE's decision um, and in joining the, um, in joining the uh, uh, litigation against this policy. So uh, luckily we, uh, the government rescinded this policy, but, but what, would have, what would have happened to international students if the university did not join these forces to go against this? Or how do you plan on um, combating these issues in future? So yeah, these are the yeah. So I'll answer the first one rather quickly, which is there was never a plan. I'm not sure there was ever a decision. It was just sort of this opportunity and that was really interesting and then another opportunity and that sounded interesting, right? So it just sort of evolved. Um, so the second one, which is a more important question I wanna spend a little bit more time on. Um, I know that that probably felt slow to you all. Um, it, our response was immediate and swift in what we can do, which is working to communicate with congressional delegations. It makes probably little sense to you all, but we are part of a state system and we cannot individually as Stony Brook join lawsuits, right? We have to have the kind of state, the SUNY system or the attorney general of the state. And I know this sounds very bureaucratic, but these are not, as a legal entity, right, working inside a state system, right, we are really part of the state of New York. So we have to be part of whatever the state of New York is doing on lawsuits. Does that make some sense? So working behind the scenes, talking to people about the importance of the state of New York having a position on this, talking with people in Washington about what just a horrible policy that was, advocating loudly and strongly against it, talking to other leaders in higher education, how do we do this? And, and we, we signed on to petitions because we can do that because that's not a legal action. Does that make some sense? I know it's kind of confusing, but it, we can't just file lawsuits on our behalf. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But we were working on it immediately um, because of the importance, not, I mean, firstly to our community but to the United States of America. Part of the reason why the US is a strong nation is because we have been a nation of immigrants from its very beginning. We have brought talent, we have attracted, and unfortunately also forced, talented people to come to the United States from around the world. And our strength is that we are a global nation. We have immigrants from everywhere. And our educational system is strong because we bring together such a global, diverse community to live and learn from one another. And we are very committed to that at Stony Brook. Thank you so much. And I can notice lots of questions coming in from uh, online participants. But uh, because of the time stream I received, I uh, have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question asked by a student saying that uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, Chinese people and Chinese international students are suffering huge discrimination. How does Stony Brook University solve the discrimination problem? Well, that's a big question, a very important one at this moment. Um, I think solving the discrimination problem um, is a huge challenge. It is something we all need to work on and to make sure that our community um, understands fully the, what our students um, and just our larger um, Asian and Asian American community have been experiencing 
Um, I think that's a really important first step. Um, and then um, helping everybody understand what we as a community need to do to change and doing the work we can to advocate more broadly um, in our local community um, as well as in the US. This is not something that is limited to Stony Brook by any means. This is unfortunately a much larger problem in the US more broadly, and we have a lot of work to do on that. Very good. And uh, I will ask last question among the few. It said, uh, will gradu graduate international students, uh, or graduate, will gra uh, sorry, will graduate international students allow to hold their TA line or work remotely? Uh, when they are abroad? Um, there are a lot of legal ramifications to that question. Um, and we are investigating it and working on it, but we wanna ensure that we do nothing that might danger a student's visa status in the future. Um, we wanna be certain that if people are involved with federal grants that we are in no way placing those grants at jeopardy so there are a lot of legal details that we are investigating and trying to work through thank you so much i think we worked very perfectly well within an hour so i'd like to leave one minute for you dr mckinney's to wrap it up uh, do you have any comments or suggestions for international students yeah, well, it is really a delight to get to meet some of you this morning. Um, I know that we have such a large and vibrant international community, and I look forward to a time when um, I can meet more of you. I really look forward to a time when I can meet you in person, because maybe that will mean that um, we have the, the pandemic at least enough behind us that we can be together in person. Um, you all bring so much to our community. Um, for those of you who are still abroad, I hope you are able to join us in person this fall. Um, I know it's enormously complicated um, getting here. We're going to try to do everything we can to ensure that you can continue your academic journey, um, even if you're not able to physically get here in the fall. Um, and please keep raising um, the kinds of issues and questions and problems that we can work on together to solve. So glad to meet you all and, and thank you for entrusting Stony Brook uh, with your education. So thank you so much, Dr. McKinney, for your time and effort to initiate this conversation with our international students. So on behalf of our international students and international uh, faculty and the staff, I want to thank you. I know you have so many things on your plate, lots of urgent things, but this is one of your priorities and I'm so glad you had the chance to meet with our panelists and many people online. They are very enthusiastic. As we prepare for this, uh, this webinar, we have so many international students express their deep appreciation for your leadership at this early stage when you come abroad. So I want to thank you and also I want to let you know that my office, Office of Global Affairs, uh, is deeply committed to working with you under your leadership and we will make sure that all international students' questions and concerns will be addressed timely. And I want to thank our panelists today and all those who are online. And we are going to continue with this kind of conversation. And I want you to contribute, uh, not only to benefit from what we do, but also to contribute to the very cause we're all deeply committed to. So thank you again. And thank you, Dr. McKinney. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, online participants. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Have a good day. Have a good day. Bye-bye.